You are listening to Harvest Bible Chapel KL. For more information, please visit our website at www.harvestkl.org. Wow, well, I don't know about you, but I'm super grateful for uh, the teaching that our kids are receiving, uh, that they get to understand who Jesus is, uh, that there is a faithfulness to those who are leading that ministry and those who are serving in that ministry. And uh, I would just encourage you that uh, even at the end of today, for those who you saw standing and serving our kids, uh, even if you don't have kids in children's ministry, thank them for what they're doing uh, for our church family and for the way that they're serving the Lord in that way. You know, it's not always easy to be a volunteer in our kids' ministry. Uh, I know some of you are like, man, I could never do that. That's just not my place, and that's okay. There's other places for you in that. Uh, But we uh, certainly want to thank those who put that effort in and uh, ask you to consider uh, serving in that as well. And uh, you heard the need earlier, and I just want to uh, continue to help us understand from this story that we just heard uh, in Matthew chapter 14, where Jesus feeds the 5,000, Uh, that in this is really a message for all of us when it comes to really serving the Lord in that way. Now, to do that, we need to understand and believe that Jesus is indeed supernatural and that he is indeed uh, so much uh, more than what we are, he's able to do so much more than what we are able to do. Uh, But in that, I want you to see an important connection and that connection being that we too can receive power that Jesus has to do the work that he calls us to. However, I know that that is not often where we begin. And many times, uh, we know that we're supposed to serve some other, so people, we're supposed to serve others and spread the love of Jesus Christ, but we get overwhelmed by that task. And it becomes difficult to, to be able to, to do the things that God has called us to. And so I have a statement, and really it's in the form of a question that I want us to consider even as we look a little bit more in depth in this text and hear from God's word in it here this morning. And the question is this. It's up on the screen here as well. It's simply, uh, knowing that you are supposed to serve others, do you ever get overwhelmed by lack of resource to accomplish the ministry that God has called you to? Are you ever overwhelmed by your lack of resources to serve God and the work that he calls you to perform? I think the answer, if we are truthful and honest with each other, is that oftentimes we feel overwhelmed. The pastor is asking me to serve in this way, and I just, I'm not sure I can do that. I'm not sure I'm really the right person. I'm not sure that I'm holy enough. I'm not sure I'm gifted enough. I'm not sure I have enough time. I'm not sure I have the resources to do what's being asked of me. And really, today's story helps us answer and look into this question a little bit further. And in this, we see here, this story that Jesus is demonstrating that he is indeed supernatural. He, he can do anything. And in showing us that he can do anything in this story, it's really kind of an argument from a lesser miracle to something that he can do even greater than just feed 5,000 people from very, a very small lunch that a boy had brought to that meeting. And so the greatest miracle that we're going to talk about is that Jesus turns hearts of stone into hearts of flesh, that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And and this story here demonstrates that Jesus has the ability to do anything, and and in one way, he's going to be able to empower us to serve others, but that all points to something even greater. It points to that Jesus can save. And so let me tell you the story again. Uh, You've heard the story, you had it read to you, you had uh, Pastor Tommy teach it to you as he normally teaches it to the kids, but let's look at this story together again. Look at Matthew chapter 14, uh, verse 13 to 21 is really where the story is found, and I would just like to suggest that the story kind of happened this way. Uh, Pretend like you're in this story. What, What character do you think this story wants you to be? Well, you're not going to be Jesus. I'll tell you that one. Everybody wants to be Jesus, but that's not the character this story is really trying to get you to be. And I know you're sitting out together in a crowd, but that's not really what the story wants you to be as well. The story really wants you to be the disciples. The story is really focused on the disciples and their response to Jesus being supernatural. And so kind of think of it this way. Pretend like the best pastor in Kuala Lumpur 
has invited you to be a part of his ministry, okay? Not me, some other guy. He's fantastic. He's the best one in KL. And, and he's recently been training you about how to do ministry, how to help others learn who Jesus is. And as he's been teaching you that, you've kind of been doing some classroom work together, but he's like, you don't learn best in the classroom, so we're going to send you out to some kampungs out around KL here somewhere. And, and he sends you out, you go out two by two, and, and you're there with your partner out, and you're sharing the love of Jesus with people in all the different kampungs together. You're out there for quite a while, but, but a couple of weeks, but you come back and you're just exhausted. You're so tired. I've been focusing on the, can, you know what that feels like, right? I've been working so hard. I've been doing so many things. I've been concentrating on this, and I just want to get back to be home. And, and you get home, and Jesus is like, well, you know what? Uh, some, some tragic things have happened. My cousin has just died. And really, the, the king of the land has now said that, that he's interested in my ministry, but I don't want a political conflict with him right now. So, you know what? Let's get in a boat. Let's go do a retreat. And you're like, awesome. We've just been out doing ministry for a couple of weeks. We, we, let's go for a retreat. Let's go down to Port Dixon for a little bit and spend some time on the beach down there, right? And so we get in our car. We get in our car. There's like 13 of us, right? And we, we, we take the van that ride down. And as we're down, we're like, wait a second. I... I noticed. I know who those people are. Wait, those are those are people from our church. Those are people from that I've been trying to witness to and spread the gospel to. And why are they going the same direction we are? And and you get to Port Dixon, and and you're like, man, I just want a quiet spot on the beach to relax. I just need to recover from all the difficult ministry. Man, the great teacher, he needs to recover from his cousin dying and all. So let's, let's just sit on the beach and relax a little bit. But as soon as you get there, you see a crowd of 20,000 people walking your direction. Now, if you've ever been to Port Dixon, that's not unusual, right? It's always crowded down there. It was a bad plan to go to Port Dixon for that retreat anyways. But you, you get down there, and, and, and the teacher's like, hey, listen, we just need to do some ministry here. So you start counseling with people. You start telling people about Jesus. And, and, and the teacher is, is ministering to them in some really spectacular and super ways. And people are responding to the gospel. And, and it goes all day long. And until the end of the day, you're like, wait a second. We haven't eaten all day. Nobody's eaten all day. What do we do? And you kind of look around, and, and, uh, and the teacher says to one of you, uh, well, uh, you need to feed them, and, and you're, like, uh, you're like, man, we've got to do the math for that. What's that, what's that going to cost us to go buy all this food? And I did the math, okay, and, and it would have cost 33,000 ringgit to feed this crowd. Who has 33,000 ringgit? The 12 of us don't have 33,000 ringgit, and so it's like, oh, that doesn't... And, and, and then somebody else was like, I scanned the crowd, and I saw there's a little boy. He has a basket he brought with him today, and, and, and we can maybe share it together today. Here's all we have. Five loaves of bread, two fish for the 20,000 people in the crowd. So that's not going to work, but, but Jesus, the, he, he comes and he says, hey, bring this here to me. Bring this stuff to me. Uh, I can take care of this. And he says, the way I'm going to take care of it is you're going to feed the people. Jesus, this is all we have. We have, we, we have enough to feed the 12 of us and maybe a few more. And you want us to feed 20,000 people? That's impossible. We can't do that. We don't have the resources to actually accomplish that. And that's the situation of this story right here. Really, the story isn't about the fact that there's a crowd. The story isn't about that Jesus is doing His awesome ministry, although that's an amazing thing. The story is about what are the disciples going to do to actually do what Jesus told them and feed everybody. And in that, what we see here is that Jesus is creating a crisis to demonstrate to the disciples that they don't have the ability to do the ministry that Jesus needs them to do. And they're going to have to look outside of themselves to somebody else for that. And so after he creates that crisis in them, the teacher gets them all together and he's like, hey, don't worry, guys, I got this. And he literally 
he, he, he got it. He, he, he takes the bread and he, and he, and he breaks it and, and then he takes the fish and he puts it in the pieces and he hands the, the, the pieces to the disciples in their baskets and says, go feed the people. And, and then supernaturally, those baskets somehow keep getting refilled. It's fascinating to me that we don't get the details of how that happened. Like, what was the actual miracle looking like at that moment? I don't know. All we know is, at the end of feeding 20,000 people, 5,000 men, plus all their kids and wives that were probably with them as well, at the end of all of that, there's 12 basketfuls of bread and fish. There's an abundance of overflowing resource that God has provided to the disciples to actually do the ministry that is there. And so when you see the story that way, you begin to understand that, that the story really isn't about 5,000 people. It's really not about a basket with five, five loaves and two fishes. It's, it's not really about the crowd being healed miraculously. It's not about that at all. It's about disciples who are feeling overwhelmed to, and, and lacking in resource to do the thing that God wants them to do. So I ask you the question again. Are you ever overwhelmed by your lack of resource to serve God in the work that He calls you to perform. I couldn't serve in kids' ministry. I'm so overwhelmed by that. I couldn't ever lead our church in worship. I couldn't stand up there and do that. I'd so overwhelm. I know I'm supposed to tell people about Jesus, but, but it's so hard. I'm just so overwhelmed. I don't know where to start. I don't know what to say. I don't know where... I'm afraid of what they'll do if I tell them that. I'm so overwhelmed. But we see from this story that when we say that Jesus is supernatural and He can do anything, it includes that Jesus will provide all that I need to serve others. Really, that's the point of the story. Jesus will provide all that I need to serve others, to do the thing that He has called me to do, to love my wife the way I'm supposed to, to teach my kids the way they're supposed to, to be faithful at work the way I'm supposed to, to, to tell people about Jesus, to serve in my church. He's going to provide all that I need. His strength, His power. And He wants to use me to do it. So let me just ask you as we try to unpack some of the principles here, how has He called you to serve? Everybody here is different. They're a different personality. They're a different person. They've been given different gifts. How has He called you to serve others in this world? Maybe the more important question is, how have you responded to Jesus calling you to serve others? Many times, we respond like the disciples and we say, common sense says, we should send them away. Common sense says they need some food and we're in a very desolate place so we need to get them into the city so they can buy their own food. Sometimes we respond that way. Sometimes we respond like the disciples when Jesus says, you feed them. And we're like, whoa, Jesus, I'm inadequate and I'm scared. And so I don't do anything. Sometimes... We just want to send people away to fend for themselves instead of receive the supernatural things that God wants to do in them through Jesus Christ. And so really the question is, are you working for Christ or are you just watching on the sidelines? Jesus is compassionately involved with people in this story. And He wants you to be involved in His ministry and He will provide miraculously to supply all the needs of His people. That's really what I see out of this. Let me, let me just kind of show you those three parts of what I just said, and we'll just start this way. Number one, Jesus is compassionately involved with people. Do you see that in the story? We see here at the very beginning that they withdraw, they go to this desolate place, and verse 14 it says, when He went ashore, He saw the great crowd, and He had compassion on them, and he ministered to them. When you see people who are lost without Jesus, what's your response? When you see people who need to be ministered to in the power of God and His Spirit, 
How do you respond? Is it the way Jesus did here? I mean, Jesus really becomes the model for us. His response is that he had compassion for them. It's interesting, when you look at this word compassion, we get a clearer picture when we look at the definition. It literally means he has pity for them. He he sees them, and he doesn't see all the self-image and look at me, and I'm all dressed up nice, and so everything is going okay. He sees right into them, and he sees their brokenness, and he sees how they're hurt, and he sees how they're really not acceptable in any way. And instead of running from them, he has pity for them. Literally, we see here that Jesus, uh, multiple times it says he has compassion, or it says that he's been moved with compassion. And, and the idea of being moved, it's, it's interesting. In the Hebrew sense, it wasn't a lot of times we think about the emotions, and that's what moves us. Really, it, it was like from our inner being, our bowels, like the whole body is moved and affected when I see somebody and he has compassion is what comes out. As I was thinking about this, I realized that we can't be selfish and compassionate at the same time. But so many times, when I see somebody who is to be pitied, when I see somebody who's lost and hurting, I I don't have compassion and pity for them. I have these selfish, internal, like I'm frustrated by that. And oh no, I'm going to have to spend time with them and I have to to help them. Why can't they just help themselves? And I have these selfish, internal things that are going on. It's fascinating that Jesus reacted so differently. I was thinking about, like, this is a real story that happened historically at a real time by real people at a real place. Let me show you the place. It was around the Sea of Galilee. So if you look up here, you see the Sea of Galilee, and up top there in the red, it says Capernaum. And that's where Jesus and his disciples kind of met after the mission trip that they were out all on. And after Jesus heard about John the Baptist, they're meeting in Capernaum, but, but they get in a boat and they kind of sail to the right a little bit up to Bethsaida. And we don't know exactly where Bethsaida is. We just know that it's kind of up where the Jordan River comes in. And they're trying to get away from the city to get away from people because they all need refreshment. And I can't imagine what it would have been like to be in that boat and seeing 20,000 people running ahead of us to the spot that we're going to get to to have our nice, lonely retreat and refreshment time. Because I have a selfish heart that's sitting in that boat going, I can't believe it. I thought we were getting away. But Jesus has a heart that's like, I have compassion for them. I have pity for them. And so he, he sees there that he is compassion. So that causes him to get involved with people. Here's my statement. Jesus is compassionately involved with people. He, out of his pity, out of his compassion, he comes to the place where he gets involved with the individuals, the personalities of that crowd of 20,000 people. I think this is such a correction to us because so many times we think that ministry is something that builds up a program or an organization. We think that it's successful, that there's, there's a bunch of people who've gotten together on Sunday morning at Harvest KL, and it's the measure of all of this is that there's a lot of people here, and that's not Jesus' concern at all. His concern was for the individuals. He had compassion for them. He had pity for them and the individual people that were there. And so notice here that Jesus' model is compassion for people, not building an empire of a ministry for himself. In this, I would just encourage you to consider this application point. This compassion thing is really talking about our heart. And the compassion, or the compassion demonstrates that my heart needs to have a compassion like Jesus' heart for those who need ministry done to them. And that means that I'm going to have to combat some selfish feelings. I'm going to have to combat frustration. I'm not saying frustration is it does, it's bad that it happens. It's how do I respond to the frustration? How do I respond when I, when I begin to feel anger or discouragement or just simply tired in it? Really, my, the call is to get my heart off, my eyes off of myself and onto God's agenda because His timing is not ours. And there'll be moments where He wants you, because He supernaturally provides, He wants you to be at your lowest point so He can show you how great He is in the ministry that He's going to call you to do. Not in your strength, but in the strength of Him. Here's a second statement I, I said here. 
Jesus wants me to be involved in His ministry. <laughs> so many times we mess this up. We think, my ministry needs Jesus. And that's not really what it is. The ministry is not yours. It's His ministry, and He happens to involve you, invite you to be a part of it. And so what we see here is that Jesus wants me to be involved. Really, this is the key to the story. It's not about the feeding. It's, not about the, it's more about the disciples being trained here. The, the, the characters of the story show here that Jesus is involving them at every level. In the beginning, in the first couple of verses, he, he has a discussion that creates a crisis in them because he's trying to train them. And then in the middle, we see here that he has them handing out the food to the people in the crowd. And I don't know what that basket looked like as I put it in front of it, but it just kept having food in it because Jesus is supernatural. He's doing that miracle and he's showing me that it's his strength to do that. And then at the end, when they take up 12 baskets full and they see the abundance of it, we see here that ministry is not ours because we can't do that. It's Jesus' ministry. And He involves us, yes, but it's not based, it's not founded on us, it's not reliant upon us. He wants to use us, but it's Him that's doing the work. It's His ministry. We see here in these verses, in verse 19, it says, He ordered the crowds to sit down. He, he took the five loaves and the two fish, two fish. He looked up into heaven and prayed. And then He gave thanks. Jesus is doing all of the work. It's His ministry. Really, the action that I would encourage you here is to get involved in ministry. I mean, there might be some of you who've been like, I, I, see, I hear that we need three kids' teachers, but I don't think I could do that. We need three kids' assistants. I don't want to do that. I'm tired on Sunday. I, and what we're seeing here is that Jesus confronts all of that and says, no, He will give you the strength. It's His ministry, and He wants you to be involved in it. Serving Jesus, we must recognize that He does the work. I'm simply the assistant. And that's the mentality that we have to have when we serve others. We're not going to do it in our own power. Actually, this goes right in line with another verse that Peter told in, in his book, 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 10 and 11. I, I put one of, the, one of the phrases up here on the sc screen, but let me read both verses. It says, as each has received the gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. In other words, every one of you who are a believer of Jesus, you have a gift that you're supposed to use and steward to serve others. It says, whoever speaks as one who speaks the oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies. That's the phrase up on the screen. Because you don't do ministry as your own, you do His ministry in His power. He supplies the strength to do the thing that He wants to be accomplished. And it's only then that the praise goes to the right place. The verse finishes this way, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to Him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. If ministry ever makes you look good to others, you're doing it wrong. If you're ever motivated to look good before others and that's why you're serving, you're doing it wrong. It's to God's glory here that we say because it's His ministry that we're doing. We're just simply the lowly servants who are doing His ministry as He orders us to do. Here's the third thing I think you would understand here today. Jesus will powerfully provide for the needs of His people. This is the, really the theme of the story. So you've heard this multiple ways here this morning. And this is really where we, we need to see an important concept. Jesus provides the power. Notice here, the miracle is in the multiplication of the bread and the fish. The miracle is in the ability to give dinner to those who are in need of it. And so we ask the question, when G, in this story, what is being provided? The answer is this. Physical needs are being provided for. Jesus is healing and He's serving dinner. But more than that, He's also secondly training His disciples. He's training them to have a heart of compassion. He's training them to see that people matter most and that we need to invest in people. He's confronting their fear and inadequacy. In all of that, He's demonstrating God is sovereignly in control. We see here, that Jesus will provide powerfully, notice the second part, for the needs of His people. Notice He's providing for the people who are being ministered to. He's using you to do that. 
but he's also providing for the disciples who are working for him. And so when we see that ministry is powered by Jesus, the application is simply this. My ability to serve is provided by Jesus Christ. Are you serving in that strength? Or is it all your own thinking and your best efforts and your energy that you're relying on? See, that's not service to the king the way he wants it. You cannot do the ministry that God has called you to in your power. The problem here is, Some of you are sitting here and go, yes, I can. Yes, I have. And the problem is often comes when we see that we can do some things in our own strength and some things that even seem successful by the world's standards, but we're missing what he really wants to have accomplished in that. Because we have to come to the realization, I do not have the power to do ministry Jesus' way to get his desired results. I mean, that's what the disciples were saying, right? What? You want us to feed the crowd? Like, we don't have the ability to do that. And it's when they understood their lack of ability and then saw the supernatural power of Jesus to do what He was doing that they began to realize, oh, not my strength, not my ability, but I'm going to trust God for the strength that He provides. That's how it's done. In all of this, we're seeing that Jesus is supernatural. And he can feed a crowd of 20,000 people with with simply this, a basket of bread and fish. He can do that because he is the God of the universe. But it's not his greatest miracle. It's interesting. This is the only miracle recorded in all four Gospels other than the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And in that, just the emphasis of Jesus' power to provide for all that we need is being shown in each one of those things. But all of that is pointing in a small way to something that's even bigger that Jesus does as a miracle. Listen, when we say Jesus can do anything, we're not just saying He can give you the power to do ministry, although I want you to see that and be taught in that today. I want you to see even more than that, that that's just a small example of the greatest miracle that He does, and that's that He seeks and saves the lost. Write this down. Jesus is supernatural and His greatest miracle is that He seeks and saves people who do not yet know Him. People who are far from God. People who have, don't have the ability to actually have a relationship with God and therefore have condemnation to an eternity apart from Him in hell. And Jesus is the only one that has the supernatural ability to do the greatest miracle in this way. Luke chapter 19, verse 10 tells us about this. It's up on the screen. It says, The Son of Man, that's Jesus, came to seek and save the lost. Listen, the reason why He was multiplying bread and fish is so that He could show the power that He has to do that and so much more. And really what we see here is that when Jesus is raised from the dead and He's seen by first a couple of the disciples and then all the disciples and then by more than 500 people according to 1 Corinthians 15, He's saying, listen, everything that I've been able to do before and my promise that I can save you is able to be accomplished because I have the power over the most powerful thing in this world and that's death. Jesus is saying here, or what we're seeing here, is that the supernatural ability that Jesus has isn't just in healing people and feeding people and training disciples. It's that He is seeking and saving those who are lost. Those who don't have a relationship with Him. Those who are far from Him. So let me ask you a question here today. And ask you to respond by faith in what we're even teaching here this morning. The question is this, who needs to know that Jesus is seeking them and wants to supernaturally save them? Do you know of anybody who is lost, is really what I'm asking? Do you know of anybody who does not yet believe Jesus unto salvation? Can you think, excuse me, can you think of a name What we have here this morning is a card that we want you to use this morning and to be able to process this in not just in an internal way, not just in your thinking and your feeling, but but we want you to actively participate with us by, by saying, 
there's somebody I know that I need to write their name on this card and say, Jesus can supernaturally save them. Can you think of who that is? Go ahead, start writing right now. I'm going to have the worship team come and they're going to sing a song and, and play a song for us and lead us here this morning as we maybe respond a little bit today. If you believe that Jesus has the power to not only provide food, but also to save those whom He is seeking, as His Word says, I would just invite you to write their name down and then physically, while the song's being played, go and tape it to the cross over here. Really just trying to get you to respond more than just sitting there saying, oh, Jesus is supernatural. That's great. Oh, Jesus feeds 5,000. No, that's great. Oh, Jesus wants me to serve in the power that He provides. Absolutely. All of those things pointing to the fact that Jesus wants to save. And His mission is to seek and save the lost. And His mission includes asking you to be involved in it. Not in your own power. In His power. So really, we're going to put this name on the cross. We're going to pray and ask God to save the individual that we do as we tape it to the cross and just make record of those who are lost that need Jesus. Will you respond in the power of the Spirit saying, Jesus, I can't save this person. I can't convince this person. I can't make them follow you. But I remember you multiplied five loaves and two fish and you fed 20,000 people and you changed disciples who realized that they actually can serve in your power. So I'm asking you to help me see how I can serve in your power by simply being a prayerful beggar who asks you to save the person that I need that is on this call. So as the worship team sings, just when you're ready, stand. There's tape over there ready to go. And we're just going to tape the names. Come have a seat back here. We'll hear the rest of the song. We'll pray together and then we'll be dismissed here today. Let's think about it. Who needs Jesus? Let's write their names now and place them as the, as the worship team sings.